Good evening, everybody, and welcome to today's session. Today, 29th January, and all the students are very excited. What is the result? What is the result? When is the result? Who is that guy who is going to make the dream? Some are feeling very tense. Oh my God, one year we prepared. What is going to happen? So at this hour, where as medical students, we work really hard compared to many other people. There are so many sacrifices that we do. But at every step, there is an entrance. There is an entrance exam. And uh, there is an obstacle to jump. So doctor, today evening, I like to take this as a privilege to be part of your waiting round for the NEET PG results to come. Roshan Yadav, Deepa Tukaram and many more who are all online. <clears throat> so today I'm going to discuss three topics. Now nowadays I'm very obsessive on handwritten notes and a discussion as you all know. And we started a new telegram group. I want all of you to join the, the online MBBS, Need PG, AIMS, JIPMA, PGI, exam going telegram, telegram group. So please share it to all your friends also. Now today, let's start with the obstetrics. So the main purpose of the notes is textbook contain a lot of things. But in a bulleted point way, you should be in a position to um, register the points which are most essential in every topic, at least 20 to 25 topics. Let me tell you, there is nothing like a special preparation for MBBS exam versus, uh, I mean, the MBBS prof exams versus the NEET PG or FMG. Actually, both of them are one and same. Only thing is, the way you answer the questions are different. Concept, the conceptual clarity is more or less the same in both of them. So that is the reason we are trying to combine both the MBBS prof exam preparation and also the NEED PG FMG exam preparation in the conceptual review. We are making all in one for you to prepare right from the first year for the exam. So Manpreet Kaur, Bhargava, Manish Krishna and many more who are all online. Now, postpartum hemorrhage. What is the maternal mortality rate, doctor? It is around 130 for 1 lakh women. And the most common cause of the maternal mortality is obstetrical hemorrhage. Obstetrical hemorrhage can be of antipartum type before the delivery or postpartum. So how do you define antipartum hemorrhage is the examiner's question. Any bleed from the genital tract after 28, after 28 weeks is called antipartum hemorrhage, right? And uh, any bleed from the genitals after the delivery, is the postpartum hemorrhage. And it is this postpartum hemorrhage which is most common cause of the maternal mortality rate in India is what you need to remember. Now, what is the normal amount of the blood loss during a normal delivery doctor? It is around 500 ml. If it is a cesarean section, it is around 1000 ml. Then when do you call mild moderate, severe, massive postpartum hemorrhage. You need to be very clear on these uh, definitions. 500 ml to 1000 ml you call mild PPH. 1000 ml to 2000 ml you call moderate PPH. More than 2000 ml you call severe PPH. And you call massive obstetrical hemorrhage when it is more than 1.5 ml. I mean, 1.5 liters is what you need to remember. 
एंड इफ द हिमोग्लोबिन हैपेंस टू ड्रॉप बाय मोर देन फोर ग्राम परसेंट देन यू ट्रीट इट एज ए मैसिव हेमरेज इज व्हाट यू हैव टू बेसिकली रिमेंबर सो traditionally postpartum hemorrhage is anything more than 500 ml following a vaginal delivery and uh, the new association of obstetricians and gynecologists their definition is any cumulative blood loss more than 1000 ml or blood loss with signs and symptoms of hypovolemia within 24 hours of the birth you call it as postpartum hemorrhage is what you need to remember now what is the leading cause dr rene day for this postpartum hemorrhage one of the favorite mcqs of the examiner it is the uterine atony the uterus is stretched during pregnancy and after the delivery of the baby there should be some way that this uh, atonic uterus unless the tone is being provided by the various uterotonic drugs that uterine atony will lead to continuous bleeding the most common cause good to see pavan verma and many more i am very sure you are all brimming with that enthu about what is result what is result of neat peaching don't worry tomorrow it is going to come and uh, you are going to send me the laddu in the whatsapp that is a promise of all of you right now retained products of conception another important cause of pph any adherent placenta like accreta increta percreta any trauma during lacerations and any coagulopathy if there is any preeclampsia or hellp syndrome what is hellp duck h for hemolysis a uh, low platelet count elevated liver enzyme in this the low platelet count also can contribute to the development of the postpartum hemorrhage but what is the most common cause the most common cause any day is uterine atony can we avoid that definitely we can avoid it's an avoidable cause of the maternal mortality so that is the reason the entire world is waiting for you when are you going to finish the internship when are you going to crack the neat pg when are you going to become a topper and join md gynops many women across india are waiting for you to join and stop the obstetrical hemorrhage uterine atony and the postpartum hemorrhage that is what the entire india is waiting for you always think like that when you are studying you are studying not just for knowledge not just for top rank it is to fulfill the purpose of your birth of your life for which you are being born and became a doctor by the karma right so what are the risk factors for the development of this uterine atony anything that stretches the uterus excessively like a large for gestational age multiple gestations like twins polyhydramnios macrosomia chorio amnionitis prolonged use of oxytocin instrumental delivery bleeding diathesis they are all considered to be the risk factors is what you need to remember then how do you treat doctor you need to do uterine massage by manual compression and there are certain uterotonic drugs that you can use to improve the tone of the uterus that can be oxytocin 10 to 40 units in 1000 ml as a continuous infusion similarly you can use tranexamic acid then cyto cytotec 600 to 1000 mg rectally orally or sublingually carboprost you can use intramuscularly 25 mg but it is contraindicated if there is asthma and methyl ergonamin you can be able to use intra muscularly 2 mg but it is contraindicated if there is coronary artery disease hypertension or preeclampsia finally a surgical invasive method like bakris balloon the bakris balloon vascular ligation 
and total abdominal hysterectomy sometimes is indicated to control the postpartum hemorrhage so what is active management of third stage of the labor so this is the placenta umbilical cord and this is the uterus doctor and uh, these are the blood vessels in the uterus after removing the plasm placenta so controlled cord traction is the important part of the third stage of the labor so control cord traction uterine massage and oxytocin if you are using them that is called active management of the labor active management of the third stage of the labor so what are the incidence of postpartum hemorrhage 5% of pregnancies be prepared for every 100 deliveries you are doing five deliveries end up in pph 80% of cases it is a atonic uterus a large uterus can become atonic like big baby twins increased lichen that is polyhydramnios similarly any infections like premature rupture of membranes chorioamnionitis any prolonged labor they all can lead to atonic uterus any injuries like trauma trauma to the uterus trauma to the cervix trauma to the vagina can lead to the development of the postpartum hemorrhage any coagulopathy like von willebrand disease itp can lead to similarly any retained tissues that's called secondary postpartum hemorrhage that is when you call uh, secondary postpartum hemorrhage where retained placental bits can be responsible if at all pph is happening after 24 hours of delivery until 12th week until 12 weeks you call it as secondary postpartum hemorrhage is what you need to remember so what are the causes of the postpartum hemorrhage you can say four t's this is a very quite often asked a Uh, thing in the ward rounds t poor tone t for trauma t for thrombin deficiency t for retained tissue any of these four t's can lead to the development of postpartum hemorrhage is what you need to remember you call it as primary postpartum hemorrhage if it occur within the first 24 hours in fact within first one hour is most common time during which the primary postpartum hemorrhage occur and you call secondary postpartum hemorrhage if it is after 24 hours until 12 weeks that's the point you need to remember so how do you manage doctor prophylactically you can give intermy muscular or intravenous oxytocin 5 to 10 units is considered to be the treatment of choice you can prevent it prophylactic management if already bleeding happened then you can give intravenous oxytocin 10 to 12 units to drip is considered to be treatment of choice iv methyl ergometrin 0.2 mg the peak action will take about 90 seconds one and a half minute still you lost bleed in that one and a half minute you can also give im but what are the contraindications for the iv methyl ergometrin doctor favorite question they ask in the viva vos they ask in the ward rounds and they will also ask in the neat pg fmg and all these exams so that is the reason what we found is shortly they are going to introduce next exam so you should be mentally prepared to prepare right from the first year both for passing the board exams prof exams and also for uh, attacking the pg medical entrance together it it can go pari pass together so that is our whole objective now so we are going to build a lot of handwritten notes with the bulleted point list which will help you to do a quick revision in the last moment so on this notes you can also write your own points also and add to this and that will enrich your notes always notes is like a comprehensive summary with a clear focus on the most important points that you need to remember and you need to have in your tips 
That is the whole purpose of the nodes, right? Now, what are the contraindications for methyl ergometrine? Heart disease, pregnancy induced hypertension, RH isoimmunization, and before the second twin is being delivered, they are all considered to be the contraindications, is what you need to remember. Misoprostol. Misoprostol is prostaglandin E1, which is also uterotonic. 100 milligram per rectum is administered. Injection carboprost, it is PGF2 alpha. It is given intramuscularly only. And uh, if you give intravenously, it can lead to sudden hypertension. That's the only worry. Then recombinant factor 7, 90 milligram per kg in 3 to 5 minutes intravenous effusion, infusion. Similarly, fibrinogen, it need to be given uh, uh, to maintain more than 1 gram per liter, you need to give more than 100 milligram per deciliter. So that is what is the fibrinogen. Then cryoprecipitate, 3 ml per kg also is useful to counter the postpartum hemorrhage and uh, the FFP typically 30 ml per kg. So 10 units of cryoprecipitate or 1 liter of FFP is considered to be a very good way to control the postpartum hemorrhage. Then uterine artery which is the source of the bleeding it can be embolized. So Uterine artery embolization to avoid the obstetrical hemorrhage is an option. It can be done prophylactically also when there is any placenta previa or placenta accreta. And also it can be used for treatment in acute conditions if you are unable to control the bleed. Then you can also do an intravascular aortic balloon compression prophylactically if the bleeding is significantly enough. Then balloon tamponade, you can use a Buckreese balloon. You will be filling it with saline, sterile saline, the Buckreese balloon and uh, you can also use Sengstaken tube which is used by the gastroenterologist. Foley's catheter, it tip is having the balloon, right? Up to 100 ml, you can use condoms, so these are all the options available for the balloon tamponading. Now one of the favorite image based MCQ asked by the examiner is recognize this important gadget used for the control of the postpartum hemorrhage. What is your answer? Bakiri's balloon which is the one which is preferred in the modern time. Bakiri's balloon. So Bakri tamponade balloon it is designed specifically for the uh, obstetrical hemorrhage. Uh, it is specifically designed for the obstetrical hemorrhage. The maximum capacity of this is 800 cc, but recommended to blow it up to 250 to 500 cc. And uh, uh, it can be placed even from above at the time of caesarean section. It can be placed from above at the time of caesarean section. That's a point you need to remember. Now doc, what are the various surgical methods which are available to control the postpartum hemorrhage? So you should remember compression and brace sutures. It is the Christopher B. Lynch in 1997 has created these, these are called Lynch sutures, Heyman sutures, uterine artery ligation, ovarian artery ligation, interleliac artery ligation, hysterectomy, they are all the options available for the clinical management of the postpartum hemorrhage. The B. Lynch sutures is what you need to remember. Now, internal artery Interliliac artery ligation is a very important component of your clinical management. So that is the reason you are needed to know what are the branches of the interliliac artery. Both in anatomy and also in obstetrics and gynecology this is a favorite question. 
so there is an anterior division there is a posterior division so anterior division se niklega uterine artery obturator superior vesicle inferior vesicle inguinal pudendal middle rectal inferior gluteal vulval clitoral these are all the branches from the anterior division this is a sure shot question what are the internal iliac artery branches whether you are anatomy mbbs prof exam going or whether you are uh, neat pg fmg exam going favorite question of the examiner posterior division you need to remember superior gluteal iliolumbar and lateral sacral so that is the reason you can remember slip p is posterior division s is super gluteal i is iliolumbar and l is lateral sacral so what is the principle you will be using a snug ligature and we reduce the pulse pressure and there is a sluggish flow and that will induce the thrombosis so whenever you are managing postpartum hemorrhage what are the therapeutic goals when can you say yeah i have adequately resuscitated this lady who is having a postpartum hemorrhage you should aim for a hemoglobin more than 8 g per deciliter your transfusion must be can be called adequate if you are able to achieve a hemoglobin more than 8 g fibrinogen more than 100 pt more than 1.5 times of normal aptt typically 1.5 times of normal and platelet count more than 75000 should be maintained to call that you have therapeutically adequately managed a case of postpartum hemorrhage and uh, if you are not very sure about grouping cross matching then you can give a immediate o negative blood transfusion can be given four units of the group matched blood group blood also can be given and you will be using a 14 gauze iv cannula kitna gauze 14 gauze iv cannula is what you need to remember so doc the next important topic that you need to be very sure is uterine inversion now what is the major challenge with the inversion it lead to shock what kind of shock after all uterus is very well connected with the autonomic nervous system so there can be a neurogenic shock there can be hemorrhagic shock but the most common cause of the death due to the uterine inversion is hemorrhagic shock is what you should remember so what are the causes why the uterus which is there inside the fundus has come out and uh, led to the development of uterine inversion if the placenta implanted on to the fundus that is a common cause uterine atony also lead to inversion badly adherent placenta or any sudden cord attraction that's the reason it is called controlled cord attraction is the name which is being given to it so this is the typical uterine fundus the round ligament and the uterus has come out because of the inverted uterine inversion is what you should remember so this is how the ut- inverted uterus has come out you need to push it back and apply the tamponading effect and arrest the bleeding which is considered be the management so how do you want to manage uterine inversion first intravenous access because it is a hemorrhagic shock most common cause of the death in uterine inversion you have to give fluids blood you need to reposition the uterus you can do manual reposition or you can do hydrostatic reposition that means when people are doing bhuk hartal you will be stopping the strike by doing the watering uh, ballooning right like that you have to use a hydrostatic reposition push it back hydrostatically like that's called o sullivan's method then give injection turbutylin that will relax the uterus and then you can be able to reposition it and after that you give oxytocin 
or methyl ergometry. So that is how you can maintain the reposition uterus in a very contracted state is what you need to remember. Then you also have surgical methods called Huntington's method, Holiton method. Huntington's hota hai atraumatic clamps lagana. Holshian method hota hai resection of the constricting bands is called as the Holshian method or the surgical methods. Now doctor, how do you separate the placenta? How do you deliver the placenta? There is a controlled cord attraction. It's called Brandt and Andrews method of control cord traction. Creed's method, it is obsolete. Creed's method will lead to retained placental bits and can predispose to the PPH. So controlled cord traction is the most important method is what you need to remember. Now, what are the signs that say that the uterus, the placenta got separated? If the cord become lengthened or if there is any fresh bleeding, but the most specific sign of the placental separation is the suprapubic bulge is considered to be the most specific sign. So this is the controlled cord traction doctor. Modified Brandt Andrews method. How do you do this? The palmar surface of the left hand is placed above the pubic symphysis. I mean the examiner's hand. And the body of the uterus is pushed upwards and backwards. Upwards and backwards. And the right hand. The cord traction is in the downward and backward direction. And the uterus feels hard and contracted. So this is how the modified Brandt Andrews method of controlled cord traction is being performed is what you need to remember. Now, let's talk a bit on retained placenta. Typically the separation of placenta, if it is taking 30 minutes, and uh, how do you manage a retained placenta? You have to do a manual removal of the placenta under general anesthesia. And uh, if there are retained placental bits leading to postpartum hemorrhage, secondary postpartum hemorrhage, after 24 hours, up to 12 weeks, you need to manage by curettage. But the complication of the curettage to remove the retained placental bits is it can lead to Asherman syndrome and in future there can be issues of secondary infertility because of that sinike uh, which are formed because of the Asherman syndrome but you need to take but you need to first save the lady. Now how does the placenta separate? There are two ways by which it happens. One is called central separation. It is also called scalge separation. So in this the membranes comes first. It is more common. You can remember central separation. Membrane comes first. So it is very shiny. Marginal separation. It is also called Duncan separation. Duncan separation. Where it is called dirty. Because cotyledons comes first. Cotyledons come first. So these are the cotyledons and this is the amniotic membrane. So if the amniotic membrane comes first, it is shiny and it is called Schall's separation. If the cotyledons comes first, you will call it as the marginal separation, which is called Duncan separation. Now what is meant by Nittabuk's layer? Nittabuk is a fibrinoid layer at which the placental separation occurs. So this is the Nittabuk's layer at which the placental separation occurs. Suppose if the Nittabuk's layer is absent, then the placenta becomes tightly adherent to the underlying myometrium. And that leads to placenta accreta, increta, percreta and that can cause 
a severe postpartum hemorrhage. So the morbid adherent placenta is of three types. Accreta, increta, percreta. Percreta. Uh, Suhani Patak, very good to see after a long time. I am so happy to see you. Now you wanted the uh, telegram link, right? Okay. Yes. So you have the telegram study group link in this. Uh, right. So you can be able to click on that, use that link and join the telegram group. You please also share this uh, telegram group link to your entire classmates in your batch so that they can take an opportunity to join. Uh, and we will be posting a lot of handwritten notes, videos, quick reviews, MCQs and you get a lot of classmates. So it is like the best way today social media help to be vibrant every moment um, and our spirits to not go down because we are part of a cohort which is all preparing for the similar exam. So that's what uh, our uh, online MBBS, online MBBS need PG, AIMS, JIPMA, PGI, exam going telegram group. If you type, uh, uh, if you if you are not having the link also, I already posted the link. Um, yes, Manpreet Kauri is saying, sir, please discuss cardiology. We will discuss. We will discuss definitely. Manpreet, puche to nahi, kyo nahi discuss karenge, jaror. Now, uh, yes, doctor. So, what is Ekrita? No decidua or nita books layer. Inkrita. If there is a penetration of the villi into the myometrium, you call Inkrita. Parkrita. If the penetration is up to the serous layer, outside the uterus you have a serous layer. That is called Parkrita, is what you should remember. So, how do you manage that? How do you manage uh, this kind of an adherent placenta? You need to do laparotomy and obstetrical hysterectomy. If you are able to save the uterus, then methotrexate and uh, post-operative actinomycin to prevent the persistence. So that is considered to be the management. Now what predisposes? For the placenta to become so adherent and penetrate into the myometrium, what is the predisposing factor? Any previous caesarean section, previous curate touch, if you have previously manipulated the uterus, that is a predisposition for the placenta next in the next pregnancy, the placenta will try to go deeper into the myometrium. And uh, any low-lying placenta, in fact placenta previa, is the most common cause for development of an adherent placenta. Any chronic infections of the uterus are the predisposing factors. Now, doctor, battle door placenta, then uh, succentiate lobe. What are these things? Typically, if the umbilical cord is inserting to the outer margin of the placenta, that's called marginal insertion. That type of placenta is called battle door placenta. And uh, uh, accessory or succentiate lobe. If there is an accessory lobe that can lead to retained bits and that can predispose to accessory lobe can lead to retained bits and that can lead to the development of postpartum hemorrhage. So this is a battle door insertion doctor of umbilical cord and this is a thickened ring, thickened ring of 
the placenta which is called circumvallate placenta tomorrow neat pg exam they will give you this kind of a thing as a image based mcq you should be in a position to identify how a circumvallate placenta typically looks like so in circumvallate placenta there is a central clearing doubled up membranes on the periphery so you can see there are uh, doubled up membranes just like full hand shirt you will be sleeving no you are wearing a full hand shirt if you are putting up a sleeve then uh, it is like a doubled up membrane on the periphery and it can be associated with uh, antepartum hemorrhage and intrauterine growth retardation a circumvallate placenta can be associated with uh, the development of uh, iugr then velamentous cord that is the splitting of the cord the splitting of the cord is basically called the velamentous cord so the cord becomes split like your stethoscope like your stethoscope then if the velamentous cord occurs at the os it can lead to vasoprevia and it can lead to bleeding antepartum hemorrhage but what is the source of the bleed in the vasa previa it is not the maternal blood it is the fetal blood vessels so fetal blood vessels will lead to development of fetal bleeding is the cause of the vasa previa which can be predisposed by the velamentous cord which is the splitting of the cord typically and it is a painless bleeding now how do you make the diagnosis of vasa previa doppler is always the best by which you can be able to discover that split and uh, you need to prove that the bleeding is a fetal bleeding fetal source of bleeding so you do apt test alkaline denaturation test if you add the sodium hydroxide to the vaginal blood in a test tube if it is colorless then it is maternal blood that means it is alkaline denatured if it stays red that means it is resistant to alkaline denaturation then that is fetal rbc so if the source is fetal bleeding fetal blood then it is vasa previa that's how you will be able to prove so to differentiate between maternal and fetal rbcs we use the apt test what is apt test alkaline denaturation test is what you need to remember then uh, clean hoyer betkey's test clean hoyer betkey is a quantitative test you can be able to quantitate how many fetal rbcs are there so it is a quantitative test is clean hoyer betkey and apt is a qualitative to differentiate maternal from fetal blood alkaline denaturation test is what you need to remember singer's test is another test which is a qualitative test it is also alkaline denaturation test so this is the short story which you have to be very sure about so i like to get a feedback from all of you a very good response has come sir a handwritten notes is giving a very good uh, psychological alignment as such we are sitting in the classroom right so i am going to build a lot of uh, concept based videos using uh, the handwritten uh, notes in order to and bulleted points which are easy to revise in the last moment before you go to exam so that is going to be our mission so doctor so please don't forget uh, to write uh, a good comment after this video get published please uh, write a good comment also please uh, share this uh, telegram group link each of you are having about uh, 150 to 300 uh, classmates right so you can send this joining link of this if you can post it then we want to make the telegram the most popular uh, online mbbs telegram group the most popular group in the country right so please uh, share this uh, link to all your classmates in all the groups and uh, write a couple of kind words that uh, hey this guy called dr murli bharadwaj completely jobless md general medicine no other job than to teach 
that is our inborn error of metabolism unless we spend an hour of our time speaking talking and uh, sharing with you guys the life looks very static for us so there is a reason thank you all for coming for the session so one uh, one more topic i like to discuss before we discuss in fact this is a question now we found that students have a big challenge to pass anatomy exams for that matter any mbbs exam first year second year third year final year or anything there will be about 3 uh, to 300 to 400 short notes and long notes long uh, note questions so you need to know about 8 to 10 points about each of these uh, sub topics coincidentally a subset of these 4 uh, to 500 uh, sub topics which are asked as short notes and long notes in uh, the mbbs exams there are also the topics for uh, the need pg fmg and all these exams also only thing is they ask it like a mcq and a case based question but your fundamental concepts if they are very strong doctor any kind of mcq you can answer so that is the reason i like to take up our uh, mbbs exam preparation of concepts and uh, the pg medical entrance preparation they both go hand in hand Uh, with this handwritten notes and uh, bulleted point wise notes on each of the sub topics so let's talk about brachial plexus how to crack this topic within 10 minutes so that you are ready for both need pg and also for the mbbs exam so tell your juniors who are in first year anatomy also to take opportunity to join our uh, attend our live broadcasted sessions and also subscribe to the video library of the online mbbs.com where you have 3000 video lectures 2 lakh powerpoint slides 30000 mcqs discussed and every day new videos are being added up in order to spice up your preparation you have full scale grand tests and discussions and uh, the subject wise tests online tests and discussion everything available you need not really go anywhere the need the online mbbs.com is a single point solution for both your mbbs exam preparation and also for your uh, need pg fmg usmle and all these exams licensure exams so brachial plexus brachial plexus is a network of nerves any plexus where does it lie it lies in the neck and the axilla and the axilla how is it formed ventral rami ventral is anterior dorsal is posterior okay so i created this notes with the perception of uh, helping even the anatomy first year students also so there is a reason i'll try to talk in a very basic level so please don't mind are kya hai sir aap to you are teaching like a lkg teacher yeah sometimes i need to come down to the lkg level in order to make you phd right so c5 to t1 this is an mcq for entrance and this is also the point which will be asked in the viva voce in the anatomy exam in the mbbs now there are roots trunks divisions cords you need to remember how many roots five roots five roots c5 to t1 how many trunks three trunks upper middle lower how many divisions anterior and posterior from each trunk anterior and posterior to serve the front and back of the limb then cords three lateral medial posterior no anterior cord lateral medial posterior cords so c5 c6 c7 c8 t1 these are the five roots so roots trunks divisions cords roots trunks divisions cords bachcho mere sath aur ek bar bolo roots trunks divisions cords roots are five roots c5 to 
T1. Now where do the roots stay? Where are the roots located? Behind the scalenous anterior and they emerge between the scalene muscles. Between the scalene muscles. Trunks, they cross the lower part of the posterior triangle of the neck. So typically you have the sternocleidomastoid in the neck, right? So accordingly you have anterior triangle, posterior triangle, carotid triangle. That is another story, right? So they cross the lower part of the posterior triangle of the neck. The divisions are formed behind the clavicle. Behind the clavicle divisions are formed. And the cords are arranged around the second part of the axillary artery. Cords are located around the second part of the axillary artery. So you can easily remember above the clavicle you have roots and trunks. Below the clavicle you are having the cords and branches of the brachial plexus is what you need to remember. So doctor you have lateral cord, posterior cord, medial cord. So, as I told you once more, cords are arranged around the second part of the second part of the axillary artery is what you have to basically remember. So, roots and trunks are above clavicle, divisions and cords are below clavicle. That's the point you need to appreciate. So, cords, divisions, trunks, roots, C5, C6, C7, C8, T1. Are the typical roots is what you have to write a short answer question in the tomorrow's anatomy exam. So now you have a dorsal scapular nerve it is arising from C5 right then so right at the level of the roots what are the nerves arising dorsal scapula I will try to Move down, move down, dorsal scapula nerve which supplies the rhomboids and levator scapulae. From where does it arise doc? It arise from, uh, it arise from the dorsal uh, scapular nerve is what you need to remember. Then uh, you have the first intercostal nerve. First intercostal nerve. It is arising from the T1. T1. It is another nerve arising from the roots. Whereas the C5 root, C6 root, C7 root, right? These three roots together form long thoracic nerve that supplies serratus anterior. So even this is also arising from roots. C5, C6, C7 will give rise to long thoracic nerve that supplies the serratus anterior. Then what are the nerves that come from trunk doctor? From the superior trunk comes the suprascapular nerve C5 C6 is the root value. It supplies the supraspinatus and infraspinatus, suprascapular nerve. Then nerve to subclavius is also arising from the trunk, superior trunk. So from the trunk, you have uh, suprascapular and subclavius. Then uh, from the cords, what are arising? From the lateral cord, lateral pectoral nerve that supplies pectoralis major, it will be arising from the lateral pectoral nerve. From the posterior cord, what is arising? Upper subscapular, lower subscapular, thoraco dorsal, they are all arising from the posterior cord. Thoracodorsal supplies latissimus dorsi. Lower subscapular supplies subscapularis and teres major. Upper subscapular supplies subscapularis. So this is the typical posture cord directly arising from the 
postural cord. Then what arises from the medial cord? Medial pectoral, medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. They are all arising from the medial cord. Then doctor, musculocutaneous, it is a combination. Lateral cord is giving rise to the musculocutaneous. Then uh, axillary radial, they arise from postural cord. Then the median nerve is having one medial root coming and from the medial cord and a lateral root coming from the lateral cord. Together they form the median nerve. So that is what you need to remember. So in summary, you have the scalene muscles and the brachial plexus is emerging between them and uh, above the level of the clavicle, below the level of the clavicle, that's how you divide the uh, brachial plexus. So you are having the cords, uh, the roots and trunks. They are typically above the level of the clavicle, whereas the cords and divisions are below the level of the clavicle. That is what you need to understand. So you'll remember now this is anterior scalene, this is the scalene muscle triangle, the middle scalene, and uh, this is the axillary artery. Second part is accompanying the cords. That's what you should remember. So C5, C6, C7, C8, T1. C5 and C6 combine to form upper trunk. C7 alone will form middle trunk. C8, T1 will form lower trunk. Once more. Upper trunk will contribute to the lateral cord. And uh, upper trunk also will contribute to the postural cord. Middle trunk will contribute to lateral cord. And also it contributes to postural cord. Lateral trunk contributes to medial cord and also contributes to postural cord. So postural cord is receiving input from the lateral, medial, upper. Lateral, middle and upper. All the three are, con are contributing to postural cord. Whereas lateral cord is only receiving from upper and middle and the medial cord is only receiving from the uh, middle and lower trunks. So that is a funda which you need to remember. So three roots, from the roots, three nerves are coming. From the trunk, only upper trunk, one nerve is coming. From the divisions, there are no nerves coming at all. In the case of the cords, from the lateral cord, three nerves, medial cord, five nerves, postural cord, five nerves. That is what you need to ultimately remember. So now quickly tell me doctor, what are the branches of the brachial plexus? So a lot of times in MBBS exam, brachial plexus come like a uh, ghost. Uh, it, it comes like a uh, long cushion. So you should be very sure. Once more, there are at least 15 to 20 MCQs that come from this topic of brachial plexus when we talk from the entrance exam perspective. So doctor, from roots what comes? Dorsal scapula C5, Naruto subclavia C5 and 6, long thoracic nerve C5, 6, 7 and even the C5 root of phrenic nerve also comes from the roots of brachial plexus. From the trunks, only upper trunk gives size, that is suprascapular nerve comes from the C5 and 6. No branches come from the divisions. Then from the lateral cord, three nerves, lateral pectoral, lateral root of median and muscular cutaneous. Medial cord, you have medial pectoral, medial root of median, medial cutaneous nerve of forearm, medial cutaneous nerve of arm and ulnar nerve. And from the posture cord, upper subscapular, thoracodorsal and lower subscapular. Now what is the main distribution? What is the distribution of all these main nerves of the brachial plexus doctor? All the anterior compartment muscles of the arm, 
like biceps brachii, which are flexors of the elbow. They are by the musculocutaneous. Most flexors of the forearm and the intrinsic muscles of the hand, they are by the median. Median is called laborer's nerve. Annar, typically intrinsic muscles in the hand, flexor carpi ulnaris, and the medial part of the flexor digitorum profundus in the forearm. You have a very important muscle called flexor digitorum profundus. The medial half of it is contributed by ulnar nerve. Then axillary nerve, deltoid teres minor, not major. Radial, it innervates all extensor muscles of the arm and the forearm or by the radial nerve is what you need to remember. Now one to comments about each of them. Dorsal scapula, it arises from the C5 root. Then it runs deep to the levator scalp, levator scapulae, and it supplies levator scapulae and the two rhomboids. Narutu subclavius, it's small, arises at the junction of C5, C6 ventral rami. That is called herb point. What is that called? Herb point. And it supplies subclavius. So C5, C6 meeting point is called herb point and from the herb point comes the Narutu subclavius and uh, the suprascapular nerve. Narutu subclavius and suprascapular nerve. These are the two nerves that come from the herb point. From the herb point anterior and posterior division will be bifurcating is what you need to remember. Long thoracic nerve. C567, it supplies the serratus anterior muscle and uh, if you look at the serratus anterior muscle, the first two digitations are by C5 root, next two are C6 root and uh, lowest four digitations are by C7. So totally it has eight digitations. Digitations means like this. The serratus anterior is having, it's like an eight piece. So, first two digitations C5, C6 is next to two digitations, C7 is lowest four digitations is what you need to remember. So, this is how the serratus anterior and its digitations that we are talking about. The totally eight digitations that serratus anterior is having is what you need to remember. So, this is the dorsal scapular nerve, Naruto subclavius, then uh, suprascapular nerve, long thoracic nerve, you are able to classically see. Now, suprascapular nerve, C5, C6, herbs point. It is the one which is giving rise to suprascapular nerve. And what does suprascapular supply, doc? Supraspinidus, infraspinidus, and articular remi of the, they go to the shoulder and acromioclavicular joint. Then upper subscapular nerve. There's upper and lower subscapular nerve. Upper subscapular nerve is smaller than lower. It enters subscapularis and supplies subscapularis. Lower subscapular now, please remember, this is one of the favorite questions of the examiner. Lower subscapula not only supplies the subscapularis muscle, it also supplies tedis major, is supplied by lower subscapular nerve, is what you need to remember. Then comes the thoracodorsal nerve. Thoracodorsal arises from upper and lower subscapular nerves between, between the two. And it supplies latissimus dorsi. You'll remember, right? Now, any lesion of this long thoracic nerve which supplies the serratus anterior, what will lead to? Now, let us talk a bit on clinical anatomy of this uh, long thoracic nerve. First of all, why it should get injured? If you are lifting heavy load on the shoulder, like 
you are a railway coolie worker or anybody who is lifting heavy loads on the shoulder right that is the cause of long thoracic nerve injury that lead to winging of the scapula where the scapula's medial boundary medial border this is the scapula so medial border become very prominent and the person will lose an ability to push and punch push and punch and even the abduction of the arm if you want to abduct the arm abduct the arm you require sedatives anterior and long thoracic nerve so how will you ask the patient how do you test the lesion of the long thoracic nerve you ask the patient to push against the resistance with the forearm extended at the elbow and flexed to 90 degrees at the shoulder so that is how you ask the person and that lead to the winging of scapula is what you need to remember so now there are two types of injuries that occur to the brachial plexus we are going to conclude this quick long question for the anatomy exam mbbs anatomy exam which is also very important for the neat pg fmg and all this we learned a lot of points that are potential prospective mcqs right now herb's palsy c5 c6 point of merger is called herb's point and any injury to that so what lead to this kind of a herb's point and herb's palsy if you are forcefully separating the head from the shoulder you are stretching the head from the shoulder at the time of the birth or if the person falls but falls on the shoulder that lead to development of herb's palsy and the narrow roots involved are c5 and c6 now one of the favorite questions of the examiner what is this policeman's tip or waiter tip position the waiter will take the tip like this right the waiter will take the tip like this tip like this right now so why do you get this waiter tip position when there is a upper brachial plexus injury where the herb's point is the one which is injured typically when c5 c6 roots are affected there is no abduction so there is a adduction adduction of the arm is what is happening there is no lateral rotation so it remains in medial rotation there is no flexion because of that there is an extension at elbow and the forearm is pronated pronation means when your palm is looking down it is pronation pressing supination means you are drinking soup so your palm is looking up palm or surface is looking up is supination so it remains in pronation so forearm is pronated elbow is extended medially rotated arm is hanging on the side in a adducted position that that is the typical herb's palsy it is also called policeman tips or a waiter tip hand is what you need to remember so this is how the baby the baby who is having the herb's palsy what is herb's point favorite mcq in entrance c5 c6 convergence point is called herb's point is what you should basically remember then what is clunky clunky is lower lower brachial plexus c8 and t1 c8 and t1 is the one which basically provides the source for the medial cord and anything that is for which median nerve is the source i mean the medial cord is the source for ulnar nerve medial cord is required and the medial root so any medial cord injury will affect ulnar is what you need to remember now what is the cause of the injury clunky birth injury once more the birth injury in a hyper abducted position you are pulling the baby out right whereas stretching the head from the shoulder 
that is earth's fancy whereas you are holding the hand and pulling out the baby then that is clumsy and suppose somebody is falling down and he held a tree that is clumsy right and uh, any cervical rib can press on c8 t1 any undue abduction of the arm while holding something when you are falling from the height so if you fall from the neat pg exam don't go into clumsy right you are falling means don't hold anything eh? completely fall and die that is much better <laughs> so doctor these are the favorite image based mcqs in the exam tomorrow examiner is going to ask you in this obstetrical maneuver what paralysis whereas in this obstetrical maneuver where you are stretching the baby's head what is a type of palsy you have to be very sure about right now what are the muscles involved with doctor in case of clumsy's paralysis ulnar nerve and the intrinsic muscles of the hand ulnar flexors of the wrist and fingers so there is a clawing of the hand because of the unopposed action of the long flexors of the fingers and extensors there is a paralysis of all interosseous because ulnar nerve supplies both dorsal and palmar interosseous pad dab palmar interosseous are for adduction dorsal for abduction both the things the guy cannot do and uh, the medial two lumbricals medial two lumbricals ulnar nerve supply they get affected and there is a sensory loss in clumsy paralysis along the ulnar side of the hand and forearm is what you need to remember so this is what you need to answer what are the roots what are the trunks what are the cards what are the branches and uh, herbs palsy clumsy palsy and what are the predisposing factors how will be the clinical presentation this makes the long notes for this topic so there are at least 400 chota 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 sub topics in anatomy that any anatomy student is supposed to do revision so 100 hours of your time if you spend there is a almost 80 to 100 hours of video available for the mbbs first year students to do the revision in anatomy another 50 to 60 hours is in biochemistry and physiology another 60 hours so you can tell your juniors that online mbbs.com video library not only prepares you for neat pg fmg it also helps you to crack your undergraduate exam with a distinction score so thank you all guys for joining this session please don't forget to write a good comment kind words after the video get published and also share this telegram group in all your classmate groups junior groups everywhere and ask the students to join online mbbs telegram group right so once more we will catch up tomorrow good night and those who are waiting for the results of neat pg enjoy a great evening tonight because tomorrow is going to be a big party of success right good night